What is it that can keep you on the straight and narrow, that will cause you to keep your commitment to your commitment? Whenever you're moving from one level to the other and you have to reinvent yourself, the adjustment, it's very, very difficult, it's very, very challenging. And I think that you need to begin to remind yourself of your why. You know, Nietzsche said, if you know the why for living, if you know why you're doing something, it will empower you to endure anything that you're going through. When you're working in corporations, you're working in financial services, it's a very competitive area, it's very, very dynamic. It's, this is the era that Peter Drucker calls the era of the three C's, accelerated change, overwhelming complexity, and tremendous competition. And so people are tensed and, and very, very stressed out. So how do you deal with that? And, and knowing why you do what it is that you do. The name of the game right now is perceptual and psychological. It's the mental adjustments that we must make in the midst of the difficulties. That's what leaders do. Leaders don't panic. They are not intimidated by the change. They're not intimidated by the difficulties. What they are, they are empowered by it. I remember reading something that said, says not what you don't have is what you think you need that keeps you from handling the difficulties and the challenges of life. That we have everything we need within us to face and to deal with whatever we have at, at, at hand because we are more powerful than anything that we're up against. For many years, I was living a life that I was not designed to do. I'm designed to speak. That's what I do. But for 42 years, I'm 62 now, for 42 years, I was doing something I wasn't designed to do because when I looked at what I wanted to do, that was to speak, to train, to empower people, that my inner conversation to myself was, Les Brown, you can't do that. You were labeled educable mental retarded in the fifth grade. You have no college training. You were born in an abandoned building on a floor. You don't even know your birth parents. You can't do that. You are DT. You were called the dumb twin. Those words became my reality for many years. And then someone came along and interrupted that conversation in my head and said, Mr. Brown, they tell me about to drop out of school. And, and I said, um, well, yes, why, I, I, I just, I can't, I'm not smart like my brother. And I'll never forget when we first met, I was in his class waiting on another student. And he came in and said, young man, go to his board and work this problem out for me. I said, sir, I can't do that. I'm not one of your students. He said, it doesn't matter. Follow my directions anyhow. And I said, I can't, sir. And he said, why? I said, sir, because I'm educable, mentally retarded. He said, don't you ever say that again. Someone's opinion of you does not have to become your reality. So now this man changed how I saw myself. When I saw myself as the dumb twin, and that was the conversation in my head that was given to me. That's what I believed. I accepted that. So the things that I was up against academically, they began to appear not as difficult as I thought they were because now he empowered me. Before then, right before then, up to that point, the things that were placed before me, I would stumble, I would slow the class down because I was convinced that I was dumb. I believed what they said to me. This guy came along and he changed my perception of myself. Someone said that people don't live life as it is, they live life as they are. And so what we have to do as leaders, I don't care where you are in customer service, managing people, that you have to do during the tough times, you have to bring the best out of yourself. Uh, without any question, the sign that I saw the other day that said, if you're going through hell, don't stop. <laughs> Keep moving. You know, you got to continue to move. And if you continue to move and make the adjustments and fine tune your strategy and, and let the people on the organization know, hey, look here, we're going to make this happen. And here's what they have to do. They have to come from a place of it's possible. And once people begin to know that it's possible, then they begin to work within that framework. Sometimes we have to be intelligently ignorant. Many people fail to achieve the goals that they're capable of doing because they judge according to appearances, they know too much, and they think themselves out of it. What we have to do in this point in time, at this period of our history, is begin to be open to the possibility that it's possible, that we can do this. And the next step is that it's necessary. It's necessary that we find a way to make this work, that we look for ways to optimize the efficiency of our operation. It's necessary that everybody gets on the same page. It's necessary that we develop one vision, one voice, and higher standards on how we're going to begin to drive the culture to impact our bottom line, to begin to take the level of customer service that we envision to another level to dominate the marketplace. It's necessary. Being second place is not a name of the game. That's not acceptable. We've got to make it happen. And that it's you and it's me. All of us 
must take ownership for it. It was George Bernard Shaw who said, the people that make it in life, they look around for the circumstances that they want, and if they can't find them, they create them. That's what leaders do. Speed of the leader, speed of the group. You have got to buy into it. You've got to believe it. The difference between leaders and, and, and people that are followers. Leaders, it, it, it's, a, it's a whole different standard for them. You know, they, it's a difference between being in the business and the business being in you. That it has to be who you are and that you set the pace for the organization. If the leader becomes cynical, if there's any doubt, if you don't have absolute faith that you can make it happen, if you become cynical, if they sense that you don't believe that it can happen, if you start complaining about the fact that you can't get your higher-ups to answer or there's so much political bureaucracy that we have to deal with, that you're frustrated, that you don't know what to do, that you're pulling your hair out, that you can't sleep at night because of the fact that it's out of your control. If you have that victim mindset and feeling powerless, that nonverbal communication communication, your facial expression, your energy, the spirit of who you are, that will permeate and contaminate the spirit of the organization. Many leaders, their effectiveness with their people, their impact, their influence begins to diminish because they don't take the time to shop in their minds, to build their faith, to build their skills, to empower and increase their confidence in themselves. So part of what we have to do, all leaders, you have to take time to pour into yourself and you've got to also reach out. You've got to have a board of advisors and, and it's your support committee that will give you a home court advantage. More teams win on at home than they do on the road. 87% why? Because they have people cheering for them. I think that all leaders should have people around them, their group, their mastermind group that will help to pour into them. There's safety and counsel that they can talk to. One of the things I always tell leaders that ask for help, not because you're weak, but because you want to remain strong and ask for help and don't stop until you get it. You, you, can, you can become a volunteer victim and choose to play your life out like that. What if you live your whole life only to discover that it was wrong? That you just showed up, they paid you just enough to keep you from quitting, and you worked just hard enough to keep from getting fired. I had a friend of mine say to me, I was in radio at that point in time working for Skyway Broadcasting Company in Columbus, Ohio, and this guy named Horace Perkins, he was the head of sales, he said, Les Brown, you are sorry. I said, what do you mean, man? You know, I'm sorry. I, I'm the number one personality in the morning here in Columbus. What do you mean? He said, it's still not enough. You can do better than that, man. Your, your abilities, your talents go beyond this microphone. You can do more than that. You're more than just a disc jockey. I said, well, how do, how do I do that? He says, never ask how. Just make your commitment that you're going to develop yourself, man. He said, live full, less and die empty. Wow, that grabbed me. I did not know at that point in time, I just saw myself as a disc jockey. He challenged me. You know, Robert Shula said, you either expand or you are expendable. Today, you've got to be flexible, you've got to be adaptable, you've got to be versatile, and you've got to take responsibility for your own education, for taking control of your own career and advancing yourself taking responsibility for your life. You're not doing it for the corporation. You're not doing it for your supervisor. You're giving your best at all times, under all circumstances, because that's who you are. I'll never forget, Mr. Washington said, Mr. Brown, I said, yes, sir. He said, what do you want to do with your life, young man? I said, I want to take care of my mother, sir. My mother's a domestic worker on Miami Beach. You know, We used to eat the food left over at Todd from the families that Obama cooked for. Them. They would say, Mamie, Whatever food is left over, you've adopted these seven kids. Mama was 46 out of third grade education. They said, you can pack it up and take it home and feed those children that you have adopted. And had they not done that, many nights we would have gone to bed hungry. Wow, I admire this mama. Saw her on knees scrubbing floors and cleaning toilets to take care of us. And looking at her example and her, her relentlessness and her unstoppable spirit, she didn't let anything stop her. And as we begin to look at ourselves and, and look at our lives and look at where we are, one of the things that I know that we can do more than we can ever begin to imagine. But many times, we have to begin to look at ourselves and realize that who we've been up to this point, 
has not cut it. And we've got to begin to challenge ourselves to dig deeper. Einstein said that thinking that has brought me this far has created some problems that this thinking can't solve. And as leaders, we have to begin to look at ourselves and we have to be the message that we bring. And if we want to produce greater results out of our people and where we are, we've got to radically change who we are. And I'll tell anybody listening to us right now, what is it about you that you know that one thing that if you radically change that one thing, it will change your leadership, it will spark a, a, a new level of inspiration and the people that you're working with and take them to another level. What is that one thing? And once we do that, it's un, unlimited of what we can do because if you're persistent and keep coming back again and again and again, even a broke clock is right twice a day. We're all born the same way. We're all born dumb, naked, and speechless. And no one comes here knowing anything. A tree can't be anything but a tree. But the greatest power that we have as human beings, we have the power to change. Choose ye this day whom ye shall serve. The mediocre part of you or the greatness that you have within you. Challenge yourself. I don't know if I could do that. When I looked at the goals that I wanted to achieve, my heart said I can do that. If you ask most people, if you had your life to live over again, do you believe that you can do more than what you've done? If most people are honest, they will raise their hands and say yes. Then why is it that we don't do this? And the way that we ever do anything is, we first make the commitment to do it. That's what we do. John F. Kennedy, he said, we're going to the moon. He wasn't a scientist. The technology was not around then. He said, in 10 years, we're going to the moon. He made a commitment. He spoke it into existence. In the beginning was the word. He said, we're going to the moon. We're gonna make this out. That was a commitment of this country. We're going to the moon. We will get there before the Russians. And there was a collective buy-in that everybody bought into it. Nobody questioned it because he said it with absolute faith. And everybody got on the page and began to look for ways of how we're gonna make this happen. But what most people do is they go to, I don't know how to do it. They go to, how do we do it? Asking those questions, no. Make the commitment. Once you make the commitment, the how, the way, the resources, the ideas, everything you need to make it happen will begin to show up and reveal itself. Many talented and gifted leaders go on unnoticed and the world never had a chance to hear from them because they allow themselves to become negative. They allow themselves to become volunteer victims. They allow themselves to focus on the problem rather than the possibilities. Jim Rohn said, when the end comes for you, let it find you conquering a new mountain, not sliding down an old one. You got to continue to stretch, continue to grow, continue to expand. Socrates says a man's reach is to supersede his grasp. Well, what are the heavens for? We have far more in ourselves, but we've got to challenge ourselves. We have to engage in that process. Most people just park. They go so far and they park and they coast out to the sunset. Who you are as a person, comes out and shows up in your leadership. So I believe it's about personal empowerment, becoming aware of who you are, self-awareness, and what is it that drives you? What is it that motivates you? What is it that you want? It's cultivating a sense of goodness and greatness within yourself and working on yourself and saying to yourself, I deserve this. I deserve this standard of greatness from myself and pushing yourself. And the next level, as you engage in that process, comes a commitment of how you manage yourself, your times, your skills, your talents, your abilities, how you work with others. As you gain greater insight into yourself, you gain greater insight into others. And out of that comes some achievements that you can point to, and then that brings you to self-fulfillment. How do we get here? What worked? What did not work? Now let's go back to the process all over again. It's a continuous, ongoing process. That's why Robert Shula said, success is never ending. We can always better our best push ourselves and challenge ourselves and be self-motivated and continue to roll we raise the bar on ourselves and have some strategic partners that will hold us accountable for a higher standard. You can run faster with a, with a, a hundred who want to go than with one around your neck. You've got to evaluate the relationships that you have around you and ask yourself the question, what is this relationship doing to me? Am I growing? Am I developing? Is it stretching me? If you're the smartest one in your group, you need to get a new group. So you've got to have people around you that you can learn from and that you can grow from. Continue to raise the bar on yourself and understand and know that there's more in you to express, to do, 
than you can ever begin to imagine. It, it, Henry David Thoreau talked about that when you're moving in the direction of your dream, you will have some uncommon hours, some magical moments. There are moments when you say, wow, I can't believe that it's me. But you also go through this period, what, what Joseph Campbell called the long, dark journey of the soul. Life will catch you on the blind side. You will say, why did this have to happen to me? Why not you? Who would you suggest? It's called life. You got to become a risk taker. Write that down. Viscott said, if you're not willing to risk, you can't grow. And if you can't grow, you can't become your best. And if you can't become your best, you can't be happy. And if you can't be happy, then what else is there? You know what? I saw Dr. Norman Vincent Peale 23 years ago. But for 13 years, I wouldn't take the chance. For 13 years, I was living in my comfort zone. For 13 years, I kept saying, Les Brown, you can't do that. Les Brown, you can't have that kind of audience. Les Brown, you don't have the oratorical skills. You don't have the knowledge. You don't have the money. I kept saying, I can't do that. There's an old African proverb that, that says, if there's no enemy within, the enemy outside can do us no harm. Bishop talks about the enemy in me. If there's no enemy within, how many of you know that you've been your own worst enemy? Raise your hands. So you've got to be willing to get outside your comfort zone. And no one could have told me that the willingness to get outside of my comfort zone, the willingness to fail, the willingness to try to experiment, the willingness to take some chances, the willingness to do something I'd never done, that in the last 12 years, for 13 years, I didn't do it. I convinced myself I couldn't do it. Then the last 12 years, I've earned in excess of $14 million. Let me tell you something, $14 million, a good garden and a healthy hog, and you can make it through the winter in Birmingham, Alabama. Do you hear me? No one could have told me I have two books, Live Your Dreams, and it's not over until you win. No one could have told me Born in an abandoned building on the floor, labeled educable mentally retarded. No college training. No one could have told me I would have produced five specials for public television. That I'd had three years ago the highest rated, fastest canceled talk show in the history of television. Because I wouldn't do those conflict and controversy shows. No one could have told me I had no idea that I could do what I'm doing right now. Let me tell you what I know about you and I don't know you. You got greatness within you. One of Dr. Ho Dr. Um, King's mentors, Dr. Howard Thurman said something one night. I was reading and I couldn't sleep. He said the ideal situation for a man or woman to die is to have family members standing around their bed, praying with them as they cross over. He said, but imagine if you will, being on your deathbed, and standing around you are the ideas, the dreams that have been given to you by life, the talents, the gifts that you've never nurtured, that you never developed, the skills that you never did anything with, standing around your bed looking at you with large angry eyes, saying we came to you, only you could have given us life, and now we must die with you forever. And the question is, if you died now, what dreams, what ideas, what talents, what abilities, what skills, what books, what sermons, what seminars, what businesses will die with you? Miles Monroe said the wealthiest place on the planet is not in the Far East, where they have oil in the ground. It's not in South Africa, where they have diamond mines. He said the wealthiest place on the planet is the cemetery. Because there you find dreams not pursued, books never written, songs never sung, sermons never delivered, businesses never erected, talents never nurtured, skills never developed. You survived one out of 40 million sperms. You were born to win. God wants you to be rich and wealthy and successful and to live the abundant life. 
You must affirm that for yourself every day. So as you look at yourself, and you look at your life, and you look at your circumstances, as you work on your goals and your dreams, here's some things I want to give you. Write this down. Hold yourself to high standards. See, what if Bishop T.D. Jakes had decided when he first received the idea of the Manpower Conference that it could not be? What if he had allowed, allowed that idea to die? We would not be here. See, many of you here, you are pregnant with some ideas. I'm telling you what I know. I will leave here this afternoon, tonight, in one hour, doing what I'm doing now, in one hour, I earn in excess of $150,000. I had no idea that I had the capacity to do what I'm doing right now. You've got genius in you. You're made in the lactis, an image of God. You've got greatness in you. You have some special stuff in you. You showed up with it. So as you look at your life and you decide to become a risk taker, make it okay to fail, to experiment, trial and error. Repeat after me, please. No test, no, test. no testimony. No yeah, you're going to face some hard times. What's the first thing they say when you get on an airplane before they take off? Fasten your seatbelt. Why? Because you will experience some turbulence before you reach a comfortable altitude. Life was testing me when the man looked at me and said, you have prostate cancer. Your tumor is too large to have the surgery. We're going to give you radiation seed implants. The most anybody's ever gotten was 90. They gave me 238. I went back three weeks ago. They checked my PSA level, which indicates the presence of cancer in your prostate area. One to four is normal. Beyond that is that you have cancer and it's spreading. When I first went a year ago, it was 6.1. When I went three weeks ago at Howard University Hospital, they gave me an MRI, it was 10.5. The guy said, I'm sorry to tell you this. I said, what do you mean? You're in the same situation that you were in when, I, when you came here. Here's something I heard. At Christ Universal Temple Church, at in a restaurant, Bishop T.D. Jakes was praying for a lady in a wheelchair. And it's odd how things come to you. When he finished praying for the lady, I'm sure there were some questions were asked that weren't verbal, that if the prayer worked, why didn't she get up and walk? And what he said as he was walking away, healing takes first place first he said healing takes place first in the spirit it didn't matter about his numbers it didn't matter about their diagnosis judge not according to appearances you must have the faith to call forth those things that be not as though they were now do you really believe? See, it's one thing to believe when you got money in your pocket. It's one thing to believe when your marriage is working out and you got your health and your children acting like they got good sense. Oh, it's good to say, oh, the Lord is blessing me. It's easy to believe then. Oh, but when you get that diagnosis, say you ain't gonna be here long. When you lose your job, when someone you thought you'd be with for the rest of your life said, no, we can't do this no more. That's when you have to stand. That's when you have to begin to live this faith. And that's not on you. That's when you got to call on something. How do you let that mind be in you? You got to be out of your mind to believe in spite of these numbers, you can still make it. In spite of the pain you're feeling, you can still come back again. You got to be out of your mind. That's right. I'm in that Christ mind. I believe it. And not when things are just favorable, not fair weather faith. And you've got to believe that. When you're going out here with your ideas, with your products, with your services, and part of being successful is you got to hold yourself to high standards. 
I use Bishop Jakes as a model. His people take care of you. He's thorough. Hold yourself to high standards, whatever you do. There's no saying, do not go where the path may lead, but go where there's no path and leave a trail. Treat people with respect. Treat them the way that you want to be treated. Tony, who's with me, who's been assigned to me, courteous, respectful, call several times. Is there anything I can do for you? Can I help you out? That's first class service. If you decide to provide first class service, John H. Johnson, book called Making Against the Odds, he said, there's no defense against an excellence that meets a pressing public need. When I decided to become involved in the motivational industry, I didn't have the money of a Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, of Zig Ziglar, of Tony Robbins, and all the other giants out there. I had the gift of gab. So what I did was I trained myself I disciplined myself to read three to four books a week. First, I started out a month. Now I've increased it with a reading system that I have. Mr. Washington said, Mr. Brown, yes, sir. Do you want to make it? Yes, sir. First, you've got to develop your mind, young man, because you don't get in life what you want, you get in life what you are. Next, you've got to develop your communication skills. Once you open your mouth, you tell the world who you are. They said about Jesus, who obviously was an effective communicator, never speck a man. The reason that you are here is because no one can milk scripture and deliver a sermon that can transform your life and have you jumping up and down like you crazy, like T.D. Jakes. I'm home one day looking at this video my daughter gave me called, He Called Me Son. Let me tell you something. By the end of that video, and I've never seen my father. When that video got to the end, I was going to the television saying, Daddy! Daddy, come back, Daddy! I pushed reverse and back it up and said, Daddy! Let me tell you something. He just broke me down in my bedroom. <laughs> All by myself. I'm looking around to see if anybody see me. <laughs> that man crafted that message, you hear me? I'm crying like I'm at a funeral. <laughs> I want my daddy. <laughs> see, that's a gift, you hear me? He, that's a gift. You, your people use his word, anointed. They should not, only, place I've ever seen it applicable is in his case. That's the only thing. I mean to tell you, I think I'm a good speaker, but this is, this is a bad boy we got up in here. <laughs> Words cannot encompass the symbolism of what we have the chance to see up in here. And yet, he's down to earth. I mean down to earth, wear all these little funny outfits he has. I mean it knocks me out. <laughs> tell you what my daughter said to me. My daughter, my oldest daughter, is on his advance team. She said, you know what? I was listening to Dion last night, and I think I'm going to call um, Bishop Jake's daddy too. I said, I wish you would. I mean, you, I, I will throw you out here right now and break his leg to by calling him daddy. Now, here's how I want you to write this down. Write down, take responsibility for your life. Take responsibility for your life. Now that's a very important. Remember what, what, what Bishop said last night about Adam? Adam, when God asked him what happened, Adam did not want to take responsibility for what he had done. Men have always tried to escape that. So the reason I'm, I'm telling you that we got to start owning our stuff as men. Write down the next R, and that is not only responsibility, but be resourceful. A lot of men, I don't have it. I had it, I'll give it. If the women had that kind of attitude, the children would starve to death. The reason that they eat, the reason that they have some place to stay and to lay their heads and have clothes on their backs because the women decide, I'm going to make it happen no matter what, and they're resourceful. My mama raised seven without a man. She cooked. She cleaned houses. Here's something else that will cause you to reach your goals when you leave here. Write this down. Reasons. 
compelling reasons. Why are you here? When you make this covenant with God, when you decide to live like a conqueror, when you decide to become more successful, to create wealth, to be a change agent in your community, what is it that can keep you on the straight and narrow that will cause you to keep your commitment to your commitment? I used to do door-to-door -door sales with a man named Sam Axelrod. Sam Axelrod was intrigued by me because when he came to pick me up, he didn't have to blow his horn. I was downstairs waiting for Sam when he came around the corner. And unlike the men that work with him and other young people, when it got dark and Sam blew the horn, everybody ran to the station wagon. And they would do a head count. And they'd say, who's here? So everybody's here except Les. And they say, hey, Les, come on. No, I'm not coming, Sam. Why? I haven't sold anything. No one sold anything, Les. It's a long run from Liberty City to Overtown. You got to pass a 20th Street Sharks and the 14th Street Gang. The Jitneys will stop running soon. I can't stop, Sam, until I sell something. See, my reason for going door to door is different than everybody else. Most people out there are trying to make some extra money to party on the weekend or to buy a new outfit or a new bicycle. The reason that I was working was to take care of my mama. The reason that I was working is because I was working on Miami Beach with my mother. My mama used to fix the kind of sweet potato pie that you couldn't eat with your shoes on. You had to take your shoes off so you can wiggle your toes. And when we would go door to door, sometimes as late as 10 o'clock at night, I would knock on the door. Who's there? Would you like to buy a nice working television set? No money down? Boy, are you crazy? Yes, I am crazy. I'm crazy about my mama, and I'm going to take care of her, and I'm going to sell a television set tonight, and it might as well be you. And after a while, somebody would say, come on in there, boy, and that better be a good set. What are the reasons? Write down why you are here at this manpower conference. Write down five compelling reasons of why you're going to keep your commitment to change your life. Keep your commitment never to go back to the life that you once lived. Keep your commitment to creating wealth for yourself, to taking care of your children, to be more responsible, to manifest Christ in you, in your life, in your community. Keep your commitment to live a life of contribution, to keep your commitment to be a conqueror and to act like it and to have authority and dominion of everything in your life. What are those reasons I got on one of my tapes? If life knocked you down, try and land on your back because if you you can look up, you can get up. Your reasons will help you to get back up again. There'll be your rod and staff to comfort you. So you got to write down five reasons. And everything that Bishop is saying and, and Bishop Merritt and all the different speakers and the relationship seminar that Brother Lewis Greenup will do, how you will incorporate the principles from this manpower conference in your life and live them and manifest them and support them. Now here's one second to the last thing. Let us say together, you got to be hungry. Hold on. Hold on. Mr. Washington, Mr. Brown, what do you want to do? Well, sir, I'd like to be a disc jockey. Mr. Brown, if you want to be a disc jockey, you got to be hungry. What do you mean by that, sir? You've got to be willing to do the things that others won't do in order to have the things tomorrow others won't have. He said, you got to work on yourself, develop yourself, develop your mind. You don't get in life what you want, you get in life what you are. Always strive to get on top in life because it's the bottom that's overcrowded. You got to be hungry. I said, yes, sir, I'm hungry. I want to be a disc jockey, sir. He said, is that right? I said, yes, sir. He said, start listening to Paul Harvey. Start listening to people who are effective communicators. Be conscious of what you're saying and how you're saying it. Because how you express yourself, once you open your mouth, you tell the world who you are. See yourself as a radio disc jockey. Start working to get sponsorship. Start creating the radio format that you want. Start developing your personality. I said, wait a minute, sir. I said, I want to be a disc jockey. I don't have a job yet. And then he quoted Whitney Young. He said, it's better to be prepared for...